You've probably heard of the Trail of Tears, when more than 4,000 Native American men, women, and children died in a series of forced removals from their homeland in the southeastern U.S. to present-day Oklahoma. They were members of the Cherokee, Seminole, Muscogee, Chickasaw, and Choctaw nations. But there was another Trail of Tears less remembered. It's the Sandy Lake Tragedy of 1850. Hundreds of Ojibwe people died as the U.S. government tricked them into leaving their homes in the Upper Great Lakes and traveling to northern Minnesota. Ojibwe stories passed down over generations say the west side of Big Sandy Lake appeared white from a distance in the summer of 1851, like it was covered in snow. But guess what it wasn't snow? It was death. Stick around as we delve into the past to unfold the forgotten history of the Sandy Lake tragedy of 1850. As you watch this video, help us hit the like button, subscribe, and turn on the notification bell. Thanks for joining us once again. Many history books continue to overlook the death and suffering of the Sandy Lake tragedy of 1850. The Sandy Lake tragedy was the culmination of a series of events centered in Sandy Lake, Minnesota, that resulted in the deaths in 1850 of about 400 Lake Superior Chippewa, when officials of the Zachary Taylor administration and Minnesota Territory tried to relocate several bands of the tribe to areas west of the Mississippi River. By changing the location for fall annuity payments, the officials intended the Chippewa to stay there for the winter and lower their resistance to relocation. Due to delayed and inadequate payments of annuities and lack of promised supplies, about 400 Ojibwe, mostly men, 12% of the tribe, died of disease, starvation, and freezing. By the 17th century, the Ojibwe nation was spread across the Lake of Superior region from east to west in modern-day Ontario, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Minnesota. The bands in Wisconsin, Michigan, and parts of eastern Minnesota that were east of the Mississippi River effectively came under the terms of the Indian Removal Act of 1830. European Americans had not yet reached these lands for settlement at that time, and there was little political pressure for Ojibwe removal. However, the mid-century wave of increased migration to Wisconsin and Minnesota had altered the political climate by 1850. European Americans pressed Congress and the President for relief from competing with the Ojibwe. High-ranking officials in President Zachary Taylor's administration planned an unlawful and unconstitutional removal of the Ojibwe, breaking multiple treaties in the process. The policy was planned by Secretary of Interior Thomas Ewing, Commissioner of Indian Affairs Orlando Brown, Minnesota Territory Governor Alexander Ramsey, and Sub-Agent John Watrous. Although Ewing and Brown left office before the events, Ramsey and Watrous were involved throughout. To force the Ojibwe west of the Mississippi, Brown directed the Bureau of Indian Affairs BIA, to move the location of the fall payment of annual annuities and provision of supplies. The BIA notified the people that rather than being held at La Pointe, Wisconsin, the economic and spiritual center of the nation, it would be moved to a sub-agency at the more isolated trade hub location of Sandy Lake, Minnesota. By bringing the Ojibwe to Minnesota in late fall and planning to delay them there, the BIA expected they would have to stay there for the winter. The officials hoped to wear down the Chippewa resistance to relocation and kept the scheme secret from local Americans and the American Indians. Once relocated, the Chippewa would spend their annuity payments in Minnesota rather than Wisconsin, benefiting the local and regional patronage system. Such an outcome would benefit the officials who planned the strategy economically and politically. Concerned about the issues of the move, many bands of Ojibwe gathered to deliberate their options. The discussions were so lengthy that the Ojibwe had little time to plant their regular spring crops. As a result, they had to go to Sandy Lake to gain payments and supplies for their survival. In the fall of 1850, Representatives from 19 Ojibwe bands packed up and started the arduous journey to the shores of Sandy Lake, where they had been told to gather by late October. Nearly 3,000 Ojibwe men waited several weeks before a government agent arrived. He informed them that the government had been unable to send the appropriate money and supplies. It was early December before a small portion of the payment finally arrived. Much of the food supplies were spoiled, and only a small percentage of the payment arrived. By this time, crowded in inadequate camps, 
About 150 Ojibwe had already died of dysentery, measles, starvation, or freezing. They returned to their home territories in peril. Aside from being weak from sickness and hunger, the Ojibwe had not expected to have to make such a winter journey. As a result, 200 to 230 more Ojibwe died before reaching their homes by the following January. As a result of this tragedy, the Lake Superior Chippewa bands, under the leadership of Chief Buffalo of La Pointe, pressed President Millard Fillmore to cancel the removal order. Many of the United States public were outraged about the government's treatment of the Ojibwe and supported the end of removal. Chief Buffalo called on Wisconsin residents to support their efforts to stay in the territory. Not wanting to live with Indians among them, European Americans encouraged the establishment of Indian reservations. Chief Buffalo, followed by more than two dozen other tribal leaders and members meeting at La Pointe, signed this letter to the President on November 1851. To the Honor Luke Lea, Commissioner of Indian Affairs, Washington, D.C. Our Father, we send you our salutations and wish you to listen to our words. We, the chiefs and headmen of the Chippewa tribe of Indians, feel ourselves aggrieved and wronged by the conduct of the U.S. agent John Rye Watrous and his advisors now among us. He has used great deception towards us in carrying out the wishes of our great father in respect to our removal. We have always been ready to listen to the words of our great father whenever he has spoken to us and to accede to his wishes. But this time, in the matter of our removal, we are in the dark. Now the man you have sent to be our agent has removed our payment to a distant place. We wish to speak now of our payment at Sandy Lake, how we suffered and were deceived there by our agent. This is what our agent told us. Come, my children, come to Sandy Lake, and you shall have plenty to eat and be fat, and I will make your payment quick. We went, but did not find him there. Instead of having a good supply of provisions to eat, we had but little, and the pork and flour furnished us had been soaked in the water and was so damaged that we could not eat it. It was this that caused so much sickness among us. After being kept there for two months waiting for our payment, the agent at length arrived and paid us our goods, but we did not get our money at all. By this time, the rivers had frozen, and we had to throw away our canoes and go to our distant homes with our families on foot. As the agent did not supply us with provisions, we were obliged to sell our blankets and buy on credit with the traders, that our children might be kept from starving and we have something to eat during our journey home. When we left for home, we saw the ground covered with the graves of our children and relatives. 170 had died during the payment. Many, too, of our young men and women fell by the way. And when we had reached home and made a careful estimate of our loss of life, we found that 230 more had died on their way home. This makes us sad to think that the payment should be removed to that place. During the three years following the Sandy Lake events, Chief Buffalo negotiated hard and became a proponent for permanent reservations in Michigan, Wisconsin, and Minnesota. This strategy was detailed under the 1854 Treaty of La Pointe. The Chippewa Ojibwe achieved their major goal to stay within their traditional territories. Many of the bands agreed to the founding of Ojibwe reservations and relocation to them. The majority of the reservations were created at already well-established Ojibwe communities. Often, it required aggregating less powerful bands with their more powerful neighbors. Under the Treaty of La Pointe, the following reservations were established. Grand Portage, Fond du Lac, Red Cliff, Lac Courte Oreille, Bad River, Lac Vieux Désert, Lance, Antonagon, and Lac du Flambeau. The following year, by the Treaty of Washington, 1855, the government created additional reservations in Minnesota for the Pillager Chippewa, Leech Lake Indian Reservations, Leech Lake, Cass Lake, and Lake Winnebagoshish Reservation Indian Reservations. For the Mississippi Chippewa, Mila Lacs Indian Reservation Reservations, Mila Lacs Lake, Sandy Lake, Pokagama Lake, Rabbit Lake, and Gull Lake, and the same treaty established the Rice Lake Indian Reservation. Because the Bureau of Land Management objected and said the Rice Lake Indian Reservation was within the boundaries of the Sandy Lake Reservation, it was never formally platted. Despite the Sandy Lake tragedy, the St. Croix Band and the Mole Lake Band held out in hopes the United States would fulfill previously broken treaties. They refused to sign the Treaty of La Pointe, 
The two Ojibwe bands lost their federal recognition and associated benefits by refusing the treaty and relocation. They did not regain legal recognition until the Indian Reorganization Act of 1934, also known as the Indian New Deal. During the non-recognition period, the Mole Lake Band became associated with the Lac du Flambeau Indian Reservation. Most of the St. Croix Band was split and associated with Lac Courtore and Mille Lacs Lake Indian Reservations. Along with the Bois Brule Band, the St. Croix Band refused to aggregate with the La Pointe Band at the river's headwaters. The U.S. Army forcibly removed them to the Gull Lake Indian Reservation in central Minnesota. Because the action was illegally taken under the Indian Removal Act despite its official end, Chief Baganagizig of the Gull Lake Band negotiated hard with the BIA to restore these groups to Wisconsin. Not having much success, Chief Baganagizig led his people in the Dakota War of 1862 against the United States. The alliance proved ill-fated, resulting in much of the Mississippi Chippewa being uprooted and removed further west. First, they were relocated to the vicinity of Leech Lake and eventually to the White Earth Indian Reservation. On October 12, 2000, the U.S. erected a memorial commemorating the Sandy Lake tragedy at the United States Army Corps of Engineers, Sandy Lake Dam Campgrounds. In addition, the state created a rest area with a view of Sandy Lake along Minnesota State Highway 65. A historical marker plaque memorializes the Sandy Lake tragedy. Minnesota erected a state history marker titled The Ojibwe's Sandy Lake Journey in 2001 at Sandy Lake. Here's part of what it says. The text reads, Tell him I blame him for the children we have lost. Aishka Bo Gokoze, Flatmouth, December 3, 1850. In late 1850, some 400 Ojibwe Indians perished because of the government's attempt to relocate them from their homes in Wisconsin and Upper Michigan to Minnesota, west of the Mississippi River. The tragedy unfolded at Sandy Lake, where thousands of Ojibwe's suffered from illness, hunger, and exposure. It continued as the Lake Superior. Ojibwe made a difficult journey home. In the 1840s, Minnesota politicians began pressuring the U.S. government to remove Ojibwe people from lands the government claimed they had ceded or given up in 1837 and 1842 treaties. Territorial Governor Alexander Ramsey and others claimed they acted to ensure the security and tranquility of white settlements. But their true motivation was economic. If Indians were moved from Wisconsin and Upper Michigan onto unceded lands in Minnesota, local traders could supply the annuity goods the government had promised to provide to the Ojibwe under the treaties, and they could trade with the Ojibwe themselves. Minnesotans could also build Indian agencies and schools in return for government funding and jobs. From the outset, the Lake Superior Ojibwe vigorously opposed removal. They pointed to the promises made at the treaty negotiations that they could remain on ceded lands. Knowing that the Ojibwe would not consent to removal, government officials devised a plan to entice the Ojibwe to Sandy Lake, hoping that they would simply remain here and abandon their homelands in Wisconsin and Michigan. In 1850, the Ojibwe were told to arrive at Sandy Lake no later than October 25th where their treaty annuities, cash, food, and other goods promised in exchange for the land sessions would be waiting for them. In prior years, these annuities for the Lake Superior Ojibwe had been distributed at La Pointe on Madeline Island in Lake Superior, a traditional hub of Ojibwe culture and a more accessible location. By November 10th, some 4,000 Ojibwe had arrived. They were ill-prepared for what they faced at Sandy Lake. The promised annuities were not waiting for them, and the last of the available limited provisions were not distributed until December 2nd after harsh winter conditions had set in. While they waited nearly six weeks, they lacked adequate food and shelter. Over 150 died from dysentery caused by spoiled government provisions and from measles. Demonstrating their steadfast desire to remain in their homelands, the Ojibwe began a challenging winter's journey home on December 3rd. As many as 250 others died along the way. On the same day, Aishka Bogokoje, the Ojibwe leader, also known as Flatmouth, told Ramsey that he held him personally at fault for the broken promises that resulted in suffering and death. As word of the Sandy Lake disaster spread, so did opposition to the government's removal policy. 
Ojibwe leaders traveled to Washington to secure guarantees that annuities would be distributed at La Pointe and that the Ojibwe could remain in their homelands. Sandy Lake, whose name is derived from the Ojibwe word Kameta Wungaguma, Lake of Sandy Waters, is rich with life. From the abundant population of fish in its depths to the beds of wild rice that line its edges. It is at the southwest end of an ancient travel route that fur traders called the Savannah Portage that connected the Great Lakes to the Mississippi River. Copper artifacts along the trail suggest this was a trade route for thousands of years. It was busy during the fur trading era, mid-18th century to mid-19th century, but was hardly a beloved passage. The primary route followed the St. Louis River to the East Savannah River, followed by a land portage to the West Savannah River and on to Sandy Lake. The Sandy River connects Sandy Lake to the Mississippi River via a short channel. The land portage was about six miles long, or 12 poses, as the French called each leg of the trip. Goods were usually hauled from one point to another to make the effort manageable. One complete move from point to point was called a pose. Much of the portage was through a tamarack swamp, which, as I'm sure you can guess, was an unpleasant experience. Lieutenant James Allen, who traveled with Henry Schoolcraft on the 1832 expedition to find the headwaters of the Mississippi, wrote the following about the portage. No idea can be formed of the difficulty of this portage without witnessing it. The men, with heavy loads, are sometimes forced to wade through a swamp of half a mile, full of roots and bushes, and over their knees in mire at every step. And where the road is dry, it is generally over a hill or across a gully, the steep banks of which are worse to pass than the swamps. Given the importance of the transit route that passed through the lake, it's no surprise that folks built settlements here. Archaeological evidence suggests that people have lived next to Sandy Lake for thousands of years. In more recent centuries, the Dakota had a village at the lake for generations. Then, as the Ojibwe moved into Minnesota, one of their first and most important village sites was at Sandy Lake. The Northwest Fur Company built a trading post at the lake in 1794. An exhausted Zebulon Pike reached the post on January 8, 1806, and stayed for a life-saving 12 days. While that trading post closed in 1816, the American Fur Company operated a post at Sandy Lake for a few years, beginning in 1826. By the mid-17th century, the world was changing for Native Americans east of the Mississippi River. In 1850, President Zachary Taylor ordered all Ojibwe in Michigan, Wisconsin, and Minnesota removed to Sandy Lake. They were told that, once they were all gathered at the lake, they would get the annuity payments due to them. Thousands of Ojibwe traveled to Sandy Lake in the fall, only to discover that the U.S. agents and Minnesota's territorial governor Ramsey refused to pay them. Food rations ran low, much of it was tainted anyway. Hundreds died from dysentery and other diseases, and the surviving Ojibwe had to travel back to their communities in the middle of winter. Despite many attempts over the years to move them out, a community of Ojibwe has continued to live at Sandy Lake, today on a 32-acre tract officially recognized as reservation land. At the end of the 19th century, Congress authorized the construction of a dam at Sandy Lake as part of the Headwaters Dam Project, which aimed to raise water levels on the Mississippi River south of the Twin Cities. The first dam, a wooden structure, was completed in 1895 and included a lock so steamboats supplying the logging camps in the Sandy Lake area could get through. A concrete dam replaced the wooden one in 1911. By the early 20th century, Sandy Lake became the scene of a vibrant vacation business with many small family-run resorts around the lake. Sandy Lake today still has that dam, a small community of Ojibwe, and lots of fish and wild rice. But those small resorts are gone, replaced by expensive vacation homes that now surround the lake. This place, even in the 21st century, has a certain magic that compels people who visit it to stick around for a while. And with that, we wrap up today's episode. Thank you for joining us once again. We hope you enjoyed this video. Remember to hit the subscribe button and turn on the notification bell so you will be the first to see our new updates. See you in our next video.